Well, good morning. It's always, uh, we could try that again. Good morning. Thank you. Um, it's always an interesting thing being a West Coast guy and also a night owl to try to present in the morning. So like my dream of heaven is to have all of you people at midnight on Pacific time to do a presentation. So <laughs> we'll, we'll, uh, we'll try to get the brain working here. What I want to give you a sense of what's happening in our research and, and through our work, um, we're going to talk, talk about the future of nonprofits. Um, within that context, I'd like to give you a, a larger sort of framework uh, for, for the work that you're doing. Um, I've been, just a little bit of background, I've been at Barna Group um, 18 years now, a little over 18 years. I started as an intern. I, uh, I, I read one of George Barna's books as a junior in, in college. And then I was making sandwiches, I think, at Biola University, and uh, I thought, well, you know, it'd be interesting to, to try to get something, jump start on a career or work somewhere. And um, I read one of his books, and um, Nancy Barna answered the phone when I called, and she says, I've got a really good job. Don't be an intern. I want you to run, run our field center, and we'll pay you $8 an hour, which was like much more than the four fifty I was making an hour <laughs> at, at Biola. And uh, I thought, wow, it's like almost double the pay and all the rest. It turns out it was a pretty crappy job, right? Like hiring, hiring high schoolers and college students to make cold call interviews around the country. Uh, but I learned a ton, and it turns out the Lord has had something in it. Um, uh, I purchased the Barna Group from George uh, three and a half years ago. It's a for-profit business. Um, and so here we are trying to help, help, you know, uh, help you think through where the future of nonprofits might go. Um, I approach this also as a dad too, right? So I have three, three kids, a 13-year-old, a 12-year-old, and an eight-year-old, Emily, Annika, and Zach. And I'm, you know, beyond just the research and caring about the future of the faith in general, I mean, let's think about the fact that we, we are desperately looking for solutions and ideas about how to connect the, the church and Christianity and this thing called following Christ with the next generation. And I think we've, we face unprecedented challenges in doing that. Um, and, and what I want to just begin with is the fact that I, I think the world is going through a period of great change. Um, we all sense this. The world is becoming more accelerated, more complex. Um, a lot of institutions are waiting to be rebuilt. I think, uh, Dr. Yu, your, your talk about trying to think about the ways in which our walls have, have broken down is very apropos uh, to the way we want to think about this today. And I want to I make this argument to you today um, that as much about the future of the tactical things that you need to do. I want to give you a larger, maybe, cultural framework for the work that you're doing. And I want to ask this question. Is it possible that our emerging global culture is something like digital Babylon? I'm going to ask you to think about this, and we're going to use this idea of Babylon as sort of a metaphor for the complexity and the acceleration of culture. It's different trying to make disciples in a culture like Babylon than it was in a culture like Jerusalem. And it's different trying to run a nonprofit. It's different trying to be, a, you know, a, a Christian nonprofit in our culture today. And we're, we're sensing, you know, many of the changes, uh, whether it's religious liberty or, or you know, questions of marriage, uh, questions of, of um, you know, generational differences and, and communication styles and technology. And the acceleration of culture is, is pretty, pretty remarkable. Now, what's interesting when you talk about Babylon, clearly one of the best known stories in scripture is that of Daniel, uh, a, a young exile who gets sent off from Jerusalem and, and uh, lives most of his life in, in uh, Babylon. And I find that the typical picture of, of uh, Daniel that we as evangelicals uh, embrace is something like this, right? I say Daniel, you say lion's den, right? And so this is Daniel, this is Daniel the Lion King. He's hanging out with Simba and Mufasa there. Um, it's it's the, the typical picture that we have of sort of this, you know, he was just cur courageous and he was able to, to keep his faith in this complex culture. But what is so fascinating about Daniel and, and other exiles is sort of the, the, the remarkable level of um, complexity that they had to face. And we really gloss over the first chapter of Daniel, where for three years he learns from the language and science and literature of one of the most pagan civilizations the world has ever known. He doesn't seem to, you know, throw himself to the lions in that circumstance. Or how about the fact that Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach, Abednego, they all take on the names, of Daniel is Belteshazzar, the names of Babylonian deities. Or how about the fact in Daniel 2 that when the, the crazy king says, I'm going to kill all the wise men because you can't even interpret my dream, 
that Daniel says later uh, in 2.26, he says, don't kill the wise men, just take me to see the king. I mean, here's the perfect opportunity, right, for a, a young Hebrew to eliminate all of his intellectual adversaries. And he says, don't kill the wise men. Well, let's talk for a minute about the different ways that I think that um, our world is becoming more and more sort of Babylon-like, and we'll talk about the digital side of it in just a minute, but just the Babylon concept here for a minute. I think there are three ways that we could draw some parallels uh, to that time to our own. And the first is this idea of alienation. There are three different concepts. The first is alienation. There are new levels of isolation from institutions and from community. And as we think about this sort of isolation, have you, any of you heard of this uh, trend called the rise of the nuns? The, 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 the level of, of uh, religiously unidentified Americans is growing. And among millennials now, more than a third say they're they're religiously, uh, uh, religiously none. Uh, you know, they, don't, they don't pick even atheist or agnostic. And we see a lot of this in our research as well. We see that uh, roughly six out of 10 or seven out of 10, depending on how you measure it, young people who grow up in a Christian home will become either prodigal, nomad, or exile in their faith journey. Huge levels of disengagement from institutions. And again, we can sort of say, woe is us as the church, but it turns out that alienation is happening in a lot of institutions. Just ask the music industry, right? Just, just talk to the publishing industry. Just look at uh, you know, Hollywood and, and their challenges. Look at, look at higher education and sort of the, the, the learning piracy bubble that's happening there where people can learn anything they want at any time online. I mean, there's a, there's a real sense in which all of these institutions are changing. Or how about the fact that public trust uh, in, in, uh, in government is at an all-time low in our country? Or how about the fact that half of Americans trust clergy? I mean, there's sort of like this half full, half empty, literally at 50%, right? Like half of all Americans say they don't trust professional clergy. That's a remarkable fact, and the Gallup organization has tracked over the last 30, 40 years this decline in trust in all institutions, but particularly religious institutions. So there's this sense of alienation that's taking place, and I'd like to also point out to you that what's happening is, is demographically pretty profound in that the very nature of young adulthood is changing. Let me just show you, this is really fascinating statistics. Sociologists estimate that there are five ways that we can measure whether a person is launched in life. This includes having uh, left home, finishing school, being financially independent, getting married, and having a child. And you can see in the 1960s, sociologists estimate that by age 30, most people had been able to, to sort of, you know, check those five things off their to-do list. Um, and, and you can see the gap between men and women because men tend to have their, ch their ch first child or get married to slightly younger women. Um, and so, but you can see that with uh, the difference now with today's generation, a huge, huge difference. And this is something that you don't hear a lot in our, in our you know, in our sort of evangelical culture, but demographics are destiny, friends, right? Like, the, the nature of 20-somethings is very, very different. They are taking much longer, if you will, to grow up. And this isn't a judgmental statement on my part, but it's just the truth of the demographics. Their, their first child now, on average, is, is in the early 30s uh, in, in Denmark. And this is happening all across the West, in Western Europe. The age of first marriage is in the, in the mid-30s. We're seeing that, that adolescence is being extended. And, and the consequence of this is that they have less financial resources, frankly, to give. Uh, they're, they're, among many other consequences, they're, there's a lot of things that they're, they're taking longer to sort of get into conventional lifestyles. Uh, and I think we have, to really, we have to really ask ourselves, what's going to be the long-term consequence? There's some ways in which today's 20-somethings are very different than 20-somethings of a generation ago. And this is having a huge impact on the way that local churches think about it. I, I can tell you this is the case because uh, about a year and a half ago, we put out a book called You Lost Me, looking at the dropout of young adults. And guess what the most common criticism from pastors is? These young people, we've seen this all before, these young people are going to come back. When? When do you think? When they have kids. First of all, this is just like, it, it's the most stupid way for us to talk about people, right? Like, like, as soon as you have a, a child, you're going to get really serious about your life. Um, and, and the other fact is that most pastors and churches actually just happen to work better for married families. So we're sort of giving, us our, uh, giving ourselves an excuse, I think, not to care about these young nomads and prodigals and exiles. 
And so demographics are destiny, and I'm just asking you to notice that alienation from some of the, the ways in which we think about institutions and institutions like the family are very significant, and they're, they're changing the landscape. Think about Daniel. He, ha- he was alienated, or Esther, alienated from a way of being Hebrew, from a way of being faithful, and had to figure out a, a completely new way of doing that. The second macro trend that we could talk about would be questions of authority, skepticism of authority. New questions about who to believe and why, and can Christianity be trusted? Um, As I mentioned, there's just an increasing skepticism that's occurring around clergy and and all institutions, Uh, but this is particularly, I think, affecting us in the evangelical community because we're we're at the sort of the center of the target. We've been, been, uh, whether we're willing to admit it or not, sort of part of what's happened in American culture. We're a very Christianized culture, as you know. More than almost 80% of Americans describe themselves as Christians, and the vast majority of, of us have some sort of Christian background. And so Christianity, and particularly evangelical Christianity, is feeling sort of the, the growing pains of an increasingly diverse, religiously diverse, sexually diverse, ethnically diverse, uh, sort of diverse in its worldviews sort of perspectives. And what we're finding is that with young people, there's an incredible amount of of skepticism about Christianity. This is from the book on Christian that we did a few years ago, uh, where the primary perceptions now of young non-Christians towards Christianity are are incredibly uh, negative. And of course, you see the the, the top perception being anti-homosexual. A couple of years ago, maybe you saw this news, we put out a cover article, The Decline and Fall of Christian America by John Meacham. And uh, it was sort sort of, commenting on the rise of the nuns. And of course, data is interesting because we can look at it from a lot of different perspectives, right? There are different ways of thinking about the fact that, you know, we are still very much a Christian nation. There aren't significantly fewer Christians in America. It's just that they're organizing differently. Just think about that for a minute. There aren't significantly fewer Christians today than there were a decade ago, but they're organizing differently. They're, they're less likely to, to, to sort of think about all the age-old ways of dividing themselves and, and being motivated and mobilized around those things. So for instance, as we study younger Christians, the ideas of, of Catholic versus Protestant, they're, they're fading away. There, there's a sense in which I don't wanna be identified as much around my, my allegiance to a particular brand or tribe or sort of a subset of Christianity. We wanna think more broadly. And, and so we're seeing a lot of this. I, I was looking for this particular cover on the internet and I found this doctored cover. This is uh, The Decline and Fall of Newsweek. It was written by Saint Anonymous, if you can see the fine writing right here. And uh, the subtitle there was, Since 1990, Christianity declines 10%, but Newsweek circulation declines 52%. That's, that's literally how some of us are mentally dealing with the change, right? It's like, well, at least we're not Newsweek. <laughs> And it's true, right? There's Newsweek is the last print edition in the last month or so, and you know, the world is changing. As I say, all institutions are up for grabs. And I mean, this is a joke. This is truly from the internet, but this, this cannot be our response as a Christian community. It's like, well, at least we're not as bad as, as the Newsweeklies. What's happening is that pop culture now is becoming to define and, and orient our perspectives about faith in very profound ways. In fact, I would say for millennials, pop culture has become the new religion. When we did a poll recently asking young people who is the most influential Christian, many young Christians said Angelina Jolie because of what she's doing for the orphans. Friends, I mean, like, I'm, I'm hoping to just sort of pry your hearts and minds open about the way the world is changing for some of our core audiences and to recognize that we're living in, a, in a, an age of, 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 uh, of culture that's very, very unique. And, and you can see here that sort of the awareness of these different leaders, um, uh, the way you can read this chart here is going left to right. Mosaics are the youngest generation often referred to as millennials. Busters are Gen X. Uh, boomers, of course, born between 1946 and, 19, 1946 and 1964. Uh, elders are the older generation. And with each of these sort of lines, the higher the line, the more favorably inclined Americans are, right? So Denzel Washington and Oprah Winfrey have the highest lines. I think this is a really positive thing, right? 50 years ago, you wouldn't have seen two African Americans at the top of the list. It's cool how American culture has changed, point that out. Uh, but what's fascinating to me is that if you look at some of the, the most famous Christian evangelical leaders, look at the trend lines here, favorability, 
A little bit of a difference, don't you think? And as we look at this, um, you, you know, we can see that Billy Graham was, was sort of in a class by himself, I think partly because of his use, in, in large part because of his use of, of television and media. And uh, we have to recognize, I think, one of the big challenges that we have is to, to help your organizations and younger Christian leaders to have a good theology of media. I find that a lot of, of busters, a lot of my generation, uh, even a lot of boomers are struggling because they don't want to be sort of that famous Christian and it's hard to be a, a, a famous pastor because everyone will sort of imagine you already have a point whether, whatever you say. So we need more people, frankly, who are, are sort of able to live in two worlds. Um, I, I think of Barna Group in some way as that, like we're able to, to use statistics and information to help mainstream media understand our world and all the rest, and we're also able to help the Christian community navigate culture. We need more organizations that are, that are thinking about having you know, a foot in both worlds, sort of mainstream culture and, and sort of the, the, the Christian culture. And, and, and this is gonna be one of the challenges that we face in a culture of alienation uh, and, and, and skepticism of authority. Who's going to speak for the, script, for the scriptures? Who's going to narrate uh, what, what Jesus might mean for our times? You can see uh, some people doing a better job of that than others. The third macro trend that I'd like to point out to you that I think points to this idea that we're in sort of a, a Babylon-like experience as a, a church in the West is access. Unprecedented access to products, services, ideas, and worldviews. Access, um, to, to think about Daniel, uh, again, we talked about alienation, we talked about authority, uh, there would be a, a real sense in which we know about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but we can well imagine that there were other young exiles who, 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 who weren't sure how, what to trust, how to trust the, the, the language of faith, and, and, and therefore sort of lost their faith. They were assimilated into, into the Babylonian culture. Um, and in a similar way, access is a very powerful reason why I think we're living in this period of, of, of Babylon-like uh, change, because Daniel and Esther... Think about one of the main reasons why their, their stories matter to us is they had unprecedented access to cultural influence. Yes, we see in the very early story in Daniel 1 that God actually blesses their ability to understand culture and to, to learn the language and to, you know, sort of this, God gives da Daniel even this sort of uh, supernatural ability to understand uh, visions and dreams. But isn't it interesting that, that Daniel and his peers uh, have greater level of access than they would have had back in Jerusalem. And this is so true uh, of our world today. Um, we could think about this. This is one of the re reasons why uh, our world is changing. No data here, but you can see why this, is, uh, why this is a different world. We're losing a sense of mainstream culture and the level of access now that young people have to information is pretty, pretty profound. Information and also just messages. Um, it's estimated that the typical teenager now is using more than seven hours of media per day. Uh, if it's, it's just remarkable how much media that, that young people are exposed to. Um, part of what this does then is it changes the way we think about organizations and even celebrities and leaders and even what we may, ourselves may become. Uh, Twitter, of course, is uh, an interesting thing if you're, if you're a, a Twitter person. Um, it's described by some young people as like a backstage pass to a concert, and you can see it's grown in its penetration recently. Um, what's happening is that Access changes the way we think, as I said, about institutions. We think we have the right to talk to anybody. Uh, my, my daughter, Emily, she's the 13-year-old. One of her best friends is Kayla. And uh, on Instagram, she follows Justin Bieber. Who doesn't? What 13-year-old what girl doesn't follow Justin Bieber? Oh, except my daughter, Emily, actually. She's not a big Justin Bieber fan. But Kayla commented on one of Justin Bieber's pictures. He posted a picture of something, and she asked... Justin Bieber, what color is that backpack? And OMG, Justin Bieber responded back in the comment section, it's purple. And, and of course, like this, for a month, she was just lit up about this, right? I mean, that's pretty cool. Who knows if it was like some digital handler, probably it was literally Justin Bieber, right? I have no idea. But here's what's interesting, right? Like it changes the way, I was a psychology major at Biola and we had our little pigeons and all the rest. Guess what happens when you have just a tiny bit of reinforcement to us as human beings? There is a huge amount of, of shaping of behavior that happens, right? 
The, the, the strongest behavior that you have is not if you feed the bird every single time, it's if you occasionally get a little dose of dopamine. And uh, what I'm, I'm asking us to consider is this is changing all of us. This isn't just Kayla, this is the story of all of us in a digital world. And, and what's happening is that we're, our expectations, uh, our, our thinking of access, our thinking of, of celebrity, our thinking of institutions. Um, I'm finding at Barna, for instance, that people seem to be more interested in, in following people than they do in following an institution. What does that do for you all as a, as a, as a brand? Are you cultivating personalities within your organizations that, that are, are tangible expressions of what your mission is? We've been thinking about this at our organization. How is it that we can have, you, you know, I'm 39 years old, I'm already thinking about how it is that we can sort of have younger people tweeting and, and writing and being cultural analysts on behalf of Barna because the world is accelerating. I'm not an expert on every subject. I'm barely an expert on any subject. Which reminds me of a story. My, my oldest daughter, when I was, uh, she was probably five or six years old, it was an early um, Sunday morning. Again, this is pretty unusual that I'd be gone from the house because I'm usually a late sleeper. But I was teaching a Sunday school class at church and she, uh, she says, Mom, where's Dad this morning? Uh, he's teaching the adults uh, at, at church. Well, what's he teaching them about? He's teaching about Jesus. Mom, he doesn't really know that much about Jesus, does he? <laughs> See, I don't know about that much about many subjects. <clears throat> All right, this is fascinating. This isn't, uh, we haven't released this data yet, but this is interesting about 18 to 29 year olds and their use of various forms of media and you can see throughout the day versus daily use of these different things and, and no surprises, uh, huge levels of, of use of these, these tools. Um, <clears throat> what's interesting to me is that we ask them, this is, this is not just using them, but learning, using them to learn something or get new information, okay? So that's the screen that we were using to, to ask them about this. Now when we ask them, was any of that information spiritual in nature, you can see that it's very small percentages of people who are using these tools for spiritual insights. And I'm just asking this question, you know, is Jesus getting lost in the data stream, right? Is there, is there a sense in which so much of this digital activity isn't in fact cultivating a different kind of sense of spirituality? I, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I'm not uh, so um, pessimistic as to say that we should, just should not do any digital activities or that you know, social media, for instance, is not worth the effort uh, I, I, quite the contrary, I think we have to be quite present in these digital spaces. But I'm asking the question, there's a fascinating book called The Shallows that raises the question of whether the internet is, is changing our, our relationship to content in a, in, in a profound way, and it says we all, it is. Um, and so we, I think we have to ask ourselves and answer this question. Like we're, we're in a very, very particular time. Again, here's, I'm gonna show you another infographic that has no data, but it'll show you exactly why in the last 15 years we're in a completely new setting as organizations and leaders. And it's this. Today's generation doesn't know what it means to go into a bank to do banking. They don't really know what record stores are. Do they need to go into a church to experience Jesus? Do they need to buy a magazine to get pornography? We're in a pretty profound period of time. Martin Luther calls the printing press God's agent of grace because he recognized that the technological change, the technological development of the printing press changed the way people could access his information. And, and this is, in a small way, just a picture of how our world is changing. At Christmas this year, my sister, uh, Sherry, she bought me sort of a retro version of the Atari system, right? And um, that's the, 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 the little thing there for any of you under the age of 30 in the room today. Like, that's, that's that little black box in the center right beneath the thing that looks like a phone, if you even remember what that is. Um, and, and so my kids were like, whoa, cool, dad, what is that? And it's like, oh, kids, a video game, kids. And we used to play this when we were young. And it was amazing because it came preloaded with like 40 different games. And they were like, that's pretty cool. We turned it on. Do you know how long that kept my kids' attention? About three minutes. And in fact, they were like, what is that little white thing that's going across the screen? That's a tennis ball? You guys had tennis balls that were like just white little dots? You know, like they can't believe this was the, the you know, this, I'm feeling old, right, at 39. 
Access, alienation, and authority. These are the things that define the experiences of exiles, and these are the things that are, I think, increasingly defining our times today. And I'm asking you to consider that, it, that there's some sort of way in which as we look at our scriptures, as we think about the story of, of Daniel, as we think about Jeremiah, who writes a lot about being in exile, that there's something that we can, we can consider about our response. And, and I, I wanna ask you this, 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 this question about how it is that you think about leading your organizations in this increasingly complex time. Because this is, this is not uh, as simple as it seems, and there are some really significant questions that I think we have to ask and begin to answer for ourselves. First of all, you know this section in Scripture, um, in Jeremiah 29, it's become, in the last few years, I've, I've heard Tim Keller speak about it quite frequently, this idea of seeking the flourishing of the city, right? And this is Jeremiah 29, uh, verse four, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says uh, to all the captives he has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. I think there's very interesting that there's a sense of place that this scripture tells us. It's you're from, you're, you're, you're now in Babylon and you're from Jerusalem. He says, build homes and plan to stay, plant gardens and eat the food they produce, marry and have children, then find spouses for them so that they may have grandchildren. Multiply, do not dwindle away, and work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. Its welfare will determine your welfare. It's a profound and, and I think timely section of scripture for us as we think about what it means to build institutions in an increasingly Babylon-like uh, setting, and again, uh, to, to, your, uh, to, to our devotion this morning, uh, the idea of rebuilding the walls. We need strong institutions that can last for multiple generations. Just a, a quick side note, you know, I bought the, the Barna Group business from George three years ago, and that was some of the most difficult, heart-wrenching, challenging, not just like what are the legal documents that, that define this transaction, but but the transition of leadership and, and, and am I called to this? And some of my colleagues and friends saying, no, just go start your own thing. And, and feeling called to just take this on as a way of recognizing that it's a fantastic brand and the work that George Barna has done deserves to continue. And I mean, like, so there's all this hard work that goes in, that, that's involved in institution building, right? There, there's, there's no simple answers. But what I wanna ask you to consider is that this, this challenge of where we're located and how we think about the church in our culture today is a very profound one. We just finished a poll uh, in January looking at Americans' perceptions of, of religious liberty. And we know that, that a majority of Americans now are concerned that religious freedom is changing. And I think there are some, there are some very real concerns that we ought to have about this. This is, this is, this is, no, this is no small matter. Um, <clears throat> what's interesting and I think a little, a little um, well, more than a little sad is that evangelical Christians, as we look at them, are most concerned and they are also the, the group of people who are most likely to say that they want Judeo-Christian values to be given sort of centrality in American culture. We have an interesting double standard, I think, within the Christian community, that it is that we, we, we want religious freedom, but what it is that we're looking for is, is is not entirely clear to people who don't understand it. it. I'm just gonna say this, for some people, it looks a little like we're looking for a theocracy. And we have to, we have to be really careful and, and, and intentional about the way we do this. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna say a little bit here about, about how controversial this idea is that we're living in a different time. I'll, I'll use, a, use myself as an example. Um, a few months ago, back in 2012, there was an editorial written, and uh, I was named in the editorial, not in a positive way. It said, I'm particularly skeptical of sweeping claims, as by the Barna Group's David Kinnaman, that the upcoming generation of churchgoers has tastes and needs radically different from those of any previous generation in human history. Nothing like a sweeping statement to meet my sweeping statements, right? <laughs> um, <clears throat> now, it, I, listen, I hate getting criticized. I don't know people who do. Um, it's kind of flattering to have people writing about you in the Wall Street Journal, positively or negatively, I guess. Uh, but I wanna ask you this, this question, like what is really happening in our culture today? W what is the state of the church? How is it that we will flourish in an increasingly pluralistic, in an increasingly diverse, in an increasingly globalized, in an increasingly technologically driven world? 
And we, we have to figure this out. We, we're doing these sets of, of events around the country called You Lost Me Alive. And in Austin, we, we met a young woman. Uh, she's in her early 30s, and she, her name is Sarah Siddiqui. She's, she's Muslim, and she, uh, she could be a Nobel Prize winner for her work in Bangladesh. She's from Bangladesh, but she lives in Austin. And I interviewed her for about 20 minutes on the stage, talking about uh, the fact that this generation is living in a more pluralistic environment. And I was trying to model for these church leaders that we need to be able to live with difference, uh, that we need to have a respectful conversation. And you would not imagine, well, maybe you can't imagine, the kinds of comments that we got through Twitter. Like, what's the point? When are we gonna get back to the main content about young Christians? This is the content about young Christians. Th this is what's happening now. We, people were saying, when are you gonna, when's the punchline? When are you gonna ask her what she, you know, like I'm gonna convert her in front of all these people to their you know, rousing applause. And, and these are pastors and leaders, friends. Like we are, we are in a very, very tough fight to define the nature of the church in a pluralistic, diverse world. One in which, frankly, if we're being honest, that the, the West is changing. Fareed Zakaria's book, uh, The, uh, the Post-American World, is an important book for us to, to contemplate. The American church is not, or is, is very quickly losing uh, its, its role as the epicenter of, of Christianity, it, it, if, it's, if, if we could even say that. And, and what good news is that? Isn't that awesome, right? How, how do we recognize and appreciate that? And your institutions, your communications, your fundraising is going to largely determine the imagination of, of, of the Christian community about how we deal with this cultural change. Will the people who receive your fundraising appeals, when they see a, a magazine title that says the end of Christian America, will they doctor the image and say, well, it's a good thing we're not Newsweek? And I'm asking you to, to consider how is it that we're changing and shaping the hearts of, of, these, young pe of these young people and, in tr and truly the church. These are important questions of stewardship. And we can take an easy road out where we say religious liberty is under attack and, and we have to defend it. And it's, it's life or death matters here in America today. And, and I'm just asking you to be, to be honest, to be clear to use your prophetic imagination about what's, what's really true. There's a great book uh, called The American Civil War as Theological Crisis by Mark Knoll, who makes an argument, and uh, I've not shown this to Mark, or maybe he would, he would make a, uh, <clears throat> he would, maybe he wouldn't like it, but, but my, my interpretation of the way he talked about the role of the church in the 1860s versus today was something like this, that, that what's happened is that the church in, in the 1860s had lots of property and lots of influence and it ran public education, for instance. And <clears throat> everything else was, was by, by comparison relatively small. And what's happened in the last 150 years in an age of, of industrialization and electrification and now digitization is that everything is larger and more complex and multinational corporations, and this is something of our Babylon experience. How does the gospel go forward? How is it possible that a single organization or, or even the local church at its best going to change that? Actually, there's a pretty simple, question, simple answer. It's a theology of vocation. That, that the church isn't just a separate little purple box. It's that there are believers who are CEOs and workers and doctors and nurses and uh, you, you know advertisers and marketers sprinkled out uh, throughout uh, throughout our culture and this is this is what Jeremiah is telling us that we should we should seek the flourishing of organizations and companies and governments that that may not they may not always espouse our particular set of values and even in this is so fascinating to me even in the pages. Of, of Jeremiah, even as we read his story, <clears throat> we just talked about this fascinating and sort of hallowed scripture of seek the flourishing of the city. In Jeremiah, tw uh, same 29, uh, verse, uh, verse 27, um, there's a skeptic. There's someone who writes the, 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 pro the, the, the Wall Street Journal about Jeremiah, and he says, so why have you done nothing to stop Jeremiah who pretends to be a prophet among you? Jeremiah sent a letter predicting, here to Babylon predicting that our captivity will be a long one. He said, plan to build homes, plan to stay, plant, plant gardens and eat the food they produce. 
In other translations, there's this, it, it, it sort of uh, uh, expands on this, it's saying like, you know, when you plant a fruit tree, my wife and I, are, we had a tree that fell down in our back, backyard and we're talking about what to, to plant and we're thinking of planting an avocado tree. And like, we, we had this discussion, are we gonna be living in this home when the, the, the fruit's ready, right? And, and so the skeptic is saying, he's even saying we should plant trees because he thinks we're gonna be around long enough to enjoy the benefits. And that's a, isn't that interesting? Even Jeremiah encounters incredible skepticism. Uh, that's not just the only place. Jeremiah 28 has the story of Hananiah who confronts him in a public way. Uh, Jeremiah 24, I mean, throughout these sections of scripture, there's a, there's a debate that happens about how it is that the people of God ought to live in relationship with God the city of man or Babylon. Here's what I'd like us to consider as a perspective about Babylon. It is the great equalizer. It's the great equalizer. God uses something like Babylon to to level the high places and to, to bring up the low places. And I think what's happening in our church today, in our in our Christian experience in the West, is that there's something like a digital Babylon that's occurring, and it's, it's changing our relationship to institutions, and it's changing our, our perspective. And friends, we're, we're, the truth of the matter is that we're losing a lot of young exiles. They're, they're walking away from faith. And, and whether we respond well or not, uh, you know, ultimately becomes a question of their own individual hearts. But we have, we have really tough work to do to figure this out. And you can see that we're in this sort of blurring world because it's, it's more difficult to make sense even of the nonprofit landscape. Think of some of the things that you're seeing, for-profit versus nonprofit, uh, public versus private. Uh, by the way, on that uh, for-profit versus nonprofit, you know, I don't have any data on this, but I, I can well imagine if we were to ask those who know of Tom's shoes, if that's a for-profit or nonprofit, most people would imagine it's a nonprofit, right? It just turns out to be a, a really great business model. <laughs> And uh, socially conscious business, new fundraising platforms, social entrepreneurs, next generation leaders who seem to be de-emphasizing faith um, in their their organizational DNA. Um, And and again, before we just judge them for that, uh, you know, I'm finding even at Barna, we have to be uh, with the rise of Pew Research. I mean, it would be helpful to have a billion dollar endowment, friends, right? Like, I'd, I'd love to have just um, um, tons of money to do research on all sorts of things. Uh, but but they, they are particularly focused on saying they're non-advocacy, non-advocacy, you can trust us, non-advocacy. Well, for Barna Group, if we're being honest, we're an advocacy organization. We are market researchers and we've told the truth to the church. We've told the truth to the culture, but some people don't really care or notice. And we, I was having breakfast with a journalist, uh, a, a, a Jewish journalist, journalist and uh, she was saying, what's the point of your books? Like, are you, are you trying to convert us? You know, like, even as... as intelligently as we try to write this and as fair-mindedly as we do. And so there's a sense in which even at Barna, I'm trying to figure out how do, I, how do I have an organization that can speak into culture without being pigeonholed as a, an advocate for Christian causes. And that's a difficult challenge. I'm trying to build an organization. I'm trying to build a Barna group that can, that can be uh, effective, an institution that's effective in a digital Babylon. And that's a, that's, a, that's a tall challenge. Some of the ways that I'm thinking we need to do this is to recognize uh, the, the way in which uh, change is occurring faster, more in, unpredictably than ever. To lead effectively, we need to become factivists. This is a phrase that Bono used in a recent TED Talk. To be a factivist means that we're at least focusing on, on how these facts are gonna change our work. If we know, for instance, that only 16% of uh, 18 to 29 year olds know how the Bible applies to their career or field of interest, this is a true fact. What are we doing to help the 84% and even the 16% who probably don't really know what the Bible applies? We're, we've, we've lost a sense of vocational discipleship. Uh, we need to figure out how to help these young people when they're making really critical career decisions and educational decisions and questions of calling, figure this out. We need to be animated by these facts. Um, and, and, and the future does not just happen, it is created by leaders. So at Barna, our work is to try to help you um, navigate this changing world if there is anything you have questions about, um, you're free to email me. Um, part of the way that we're going about this is to provide more information on a regional basis. So if you haven't seen this, we have a new microsite at cities.barna.org uh, that, that can give you information about specific states, specific cities. Um, we're, we're trying our best to give you, you know, great information 
uh, about, about our changing world and in a very sort of national and global and also regional way. Um, we think that Hispanics, they're, they're projected to go from 17% of the U.S. population to 30% of the U.S. population. Roughly a third of, of the U.S. population in the next 35 years will be Hispanic. Friends, let's not miss this fact. Let's, let's engage the Hispanic community uh, in a significant way, uh, not just as, as sort of, if you will, window dressing on our efforts, but in a very intentional way. Uh, huge. I mean, there's a lot of places where, you know, the evangelical community is on the downswing, but when it comes to the Hispanic community, there's a lot of growth that we and others are predicting. Let's not miss that. And so we've got um, some tools that you can check out that would give you um, some insight into that. A few perspectives as we close. Um, <clears throat> The first is having a new mind to engage the Christian community, not just better products or marketing. We need a new, a new mind, a new, a new perspective, a new, a new Holy Spirit-oriented way of thinking about our times. And then we need to figure out how, um, and, and, and again, I, one of the biggest challenges I've, I think I've had as a, a young entrepreneur in buying Barna Group is this question of, um, I mean, it's been a tough three years, hasn't it? All of us have had a hard time. The, eco the economy's tough. There's fewer donor dollars. Uh, the world's changing. All, all the things that we've been talking about. And, 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 and there's a real sense as we're trying to, like, are we, am, am, I'm asking myself this question. Am I trying to grow to grow out of a selfish ambition? Uh, am, I, am I growing the business in the way that, that God wants me to? Um, am, I, am I, in fact, creating a business that helps catalyze spiritual journeys uh, spiritual transformation, and not just, not just a product, a set of products. And those are really important, I think, questions for us as stewards of, of the messages and, and organizations that we're, that we're working at. Uh, we need to place higher expectations on ourselves and the Christian community. We need, we need to say to ourselves and to our followers, um, uh, to our, our fellow, fellow believers, that it's, it's unacceptable for us to have a double standard about religious liberty. We, we, we can't speak out of both sides of our mouths as we, as we talk about what we hope America could be and, and our place in the world. Uh, there are way too many Christians, if we're being honest, that are more discipled by conservative talk radio and television than by the Bible. And, and it's, it's, we, we have work to do to help them understand why that is and, and to, help them, to help them get free of that. <clears throat> Um, we, we have to recognize the role of entrepreneurial ideas and innovators in shaping our church, not simply patching old wineskins. Uh, five ideas I have for you. Uh, realize that the era of change requires leadership, entrepreneurship, and new partnerships, maybe even new organizations. Um, as Dr. Yu said, we need strong institutions, and some of those institutions need to be institutions that are already built, but, but some of those institutions need to be, be built. And we need to uh, help incubate those ideas. And, and, and that's an important role, I think, for the, the Christian community, not to be threatened by other believers who are doing something in a new way. Um, I would ask us to add technology to our, our discussions of stewardship. We talk very effectively, I think, about time, treasure, and talent. But technology is a fourth T that we, we need to integrate into our, into our discussions and our, our, our theology. Uh, we need to establish practices to see and shape reality. Um, we, we need to have better scorecards, basically, to measure the impact that we're having. Um, and, and finally, we, this, is, this is to the point that I was making earlier about, about how many American Christians are being discipled by conservative media, uh, politically conservative media. Uh, we need to ask people to love the right things. Ultimately, we need to figure out how to help them to, to, to love Jesus in their lives and the, and, and the incarnation of, of, of Christ. Um, but this is really tough, soul-searching work, and, and I think... I think it's very easy for us to point to certain kinds of instances in our culture and, and to make that the issue when in fact it's a question of discipleship within the church. To finish, I just wanna part with this one question. It actually comes from Isaiah 43, 19. The Spirit of the Lord says that he is doing a new thing. It, it springs up. Do we not perceive it? This is our opportunity as a Christian community to be ahead of some things because we have the Holy Spirit aiding us to not be protective of institutions for the sake of being protective or for our donors or for our legacy, 
but to be truly inspired and inspiring about what Christ asks us to do in our times. And, and, and in scripture, we have this wonderful example of asking us to sort of imagine that God is ahead of us doing this work. What a privilege that we have. And it's a privilege for me to be able to share, uh, share our research with you today. So thank you very much. I hope this sets the tone for a collab.